shorter one actually this month. All right. Um, so what I want to talk about is building practical test plans, particularly kind of in mid-sized teams. So one of the things I've observed is often when you go from being a small team doing small projects, you can get away with really kind of ad hoc -y, cheap and sleazy testing practices. And as teams grow, there's a, a transitional point where folks are on the like, why can't we still test the way we used to test? It felt like testing, but it wasn't really. Uh, and there's often a lot of friction about getting uh, test plans built when you're passing through that midsize. By the time you're really big, people want big, formal, well-structured test plans. But as you're growing across things that feel big, you don't have clients who are like, we want to see all of your tests and we want to see your test plan. Uh, you're ending up with this kind of like, they clients aren't really understanding the value. Leadership isn't used to it, um, but it's become really important. Uh, and kind of snuck, often sneaks up on teams. Uh, so this is kind of what I'm talking about, kind of how you build a plan in that environment as you're going through that transition as a team. Um, I think the first thing that, to recognize is kind of why people don't test uh, in that place. Uh, there's a sense that there's not enough time. Um, there's a belief that developers can test their own work. Uh, that'll be, again, being carried forward from when things were small and you kind of could get away from that. Um, Developers often don't yet know uh, the, the tools well, and so they'll just kind of be on like, I don't know, you can't test it, um, because they haven't figured out how to build a test. Um, and you know, there'll be a reliance on the client still, particularly in web spaces, but even on other platforms, um, there'll be you know a stretch for like, well, the client can just kind of poke around. They know how this thing's going to work. Uh, they know what they want. They'll test it. Uh, as if handing them a broken thing will make them a happy client. Uh, and, and just a general sense of, you know, kind of a lack of rigor and a lack of understanding of the value related to testing. Uh, and it's just kind of this magic solution that you're supposed to get out at the other side. Um, but when you're not testing as projects get complex, your project's going to go over budget, right? It stops being cheaper not to test and starts really quickly costing you a lot of money, uh, either because the projects fail or the client's starting to scream. Uh, you're having to dispatch your CEO either on the phone or occasionally if it's bad and a big enough client in person to calm everybody down and you're going to lose money. Uh, you're either going to lose it up front because you're going to uh, stick with the client and force it through. And that's, you know, when attain uh, makes mistakes, we work with a client to make it right. Uh, but that means we end up burning a lot of our own resources. I've inherited projects from other shops that get to the end of their budget and pull up stake and walk out. Uh, most of the shops I know that do that are no longer going concerns uh, because eventually the reputation caught up with them of if they can't finish it, they're gonna bail. Uh, and so one way or the other, you're gonna lose money. Uh, and so starting to recognize that and work that into your budget assumptions that testing isn't about necessarily spending money, but it can also be about saving money in that testing cycle when you get into a lot of churn. Um, one of the things I hear kind of as you start these conversations are people kind of coming up with excuses of what they are to, you know, how they're testing really, um, right? Test your own work, which is just not testing. Um, asking it and say, well, all the developers know how to test their own work. Uh, all the good developers know that they can't. Uh, you know, there's a certain degree to which maybe they can duct tape it, but they you don't ask people to test their own work if it's really complicated. Uh, or it's the project managers are testing, right? We've always had our project manager test it. Uh, this is particularly, in my experience, true with companies that have done a lot of brochureware. Uh, you know, it's okay. Right, the, the client, the project manager kind of knows how things are going to work. But what they're really usually doing is they're walking through their demo, right? They're getting themselves ready so they know that the demo is going to work. Uh, so this just for me is demo testing. There is actually a formal version of this called ghost testing, which can be part of a comprehensive plan. But it, when it's your entire plan, all they're really doing is making sure you get through the demo without looking bad uh, and really without them looking bad. Uh, but if a client can knock them off script, and when I was a client, that was often my goal was to knock people off their script to see what was really going on under the hood. 
uh, because I could tell if they were on their script. They're never going to fail. Uh, if it fails during a demo on script, that was really bad. And project managers know that and they know how to avoid it. The other thing that will come up is when there's kind of some formal statement of testing that's not really meaningful. So right, 100% code coverage. Uh, your Salesforce requires 75% code coverage. Um, you can't deploy code without 75% coverage. Uh, and often what you get, and I, I know you guys saw, uh, have seen examples of this, of things where somebody has written uh, a whole lot of tests that fire 100% of the code and do not test validity at all, uh, where the output is just, uh, you know, the code ran, there are no compiler errors, yay. Uh, but there's no necessary, there's no rigor to the test. There's no understanding of whether or not the test actually passed. Um, so I was talking earlier about kind of, as you pass through these mid-sized projects and uh, one of the assumptions that people tend to make is that testing requires more time than not testing, right? It's extra work that we weren't doing before. Uh, and we got away with it when our project was $50 or $50,000 or $500,000, but it kept going up. We kept adding zeros to our projects. We were successful as a company. We grew. And at some point it stopped working and nobody quite understands why at 10 times that size project, all of a sudden we hit a wall. Uh, and it's because we all kind of assume, we like to believe that the value and importance of testing kind of grows linearly with the project right along the nice red line here. Um, but really, the value and importance of testing is traveling on an exponential curve. So yeah, when your project is small and simple, there's not a lot of value in testing. Uh, it can be an extra expense, an extra uh, process that you can do at the end because you're just checking a couple of little things um, that automated testing does take extra time to set up. But as the project gets more complicated and you start running those automated tests a thousand 5,000, 10,000 times, they start paying for themselves super fast. Uh, and the reality starts to change as you get further out the curve. Um, that said, it's not quite that simple, right? A as we get more complicated, sometimes we get a complicated looking project that our team's actually really awesome at. Uh, and so we can really nail it. And there isn't actually as much value. Um, but everybody still needs an editor. There needs to be some level of testing uh, to look over our shoulders. You can get away with it on the small projects, but you're not going to be able to skip it on the large. And even if it doesn't work out on every single project that you save huge amounts of time uh, and generate, you know, extra revenue because you had a good product out the door the first time, uh, in general, as you go out and get more complex, you want to have that extra testing and that extra rigor going on. Um, it is okay to recognize you can't actually test everything, uh, right? You can say 100% code coverage. You can have 100% code coverage. 100% code coverage is not 100% uh, of inputs giving you 100% of outputs. There are classic computer science problems that tell you you cannot test everything. Um, that's okay. But you can usually test more than you think. And when your developers are learning to deal with particularly automated testing and automated testing systems, there's a lot more that can be tested than people realize. It's just harder than people want it to be. Uh, and so you have to find the right balance of what you're testing and what you're not. If you're gonna build a truly comprehensive test plan, if your budget is more or less unlimited, um, you need to start, you can build a truly comprehensive plan. You can start with having a truly complete understanding of the solution, right? It is well documented. Somebody is tracking that. They know all the ins and outs as they go. Um, you have a co collection of automated tests that handle all of the things under the hood and frankly, click on every darn thing in the API on the, or in the interface, right? You can test every piece of it. Um, this is where you start to talk about go test, ghost testing, where you deploy your update and after you've done a whole bunch of rigorous tests in the background ahead of time, and now you've deployed to production, quick, go in and test the sensitive areas, go in and test the really important stuff, make sure the homepage still loads, make sure you can still log in, make sure you can still post a new piece of content, uh, just to make sure those basic functions didn't go sideways on you in, in the last second. Um, a comprehensive test plan is gonna involve really strong performance testing. Um, you're gonna talk about security and penetration testing. All things that big 
projects and consultancies have, um, but are not necessarily uh, valuable on every single project and on every single scale. Uh, and finally, you're going to include some regression testing as the project, particularly as the project ages, so that once you find something that broke, when you did an upgrade, you make sure you've got a test in there so that you never break that thing again. Um, that you have structures and mechanisms that are testing not only everything you thought to test of test in your original set of automated tests, but you have a regression testing process for everything that's come up over its history. Like classically, MySQL used to have this as even before everybody talked about test driven development in a big way, although it technically existed. Uh, Monty used to drive that every time they got a bug report, the very first thing is you wrote a test that recreated it. Uh, and he would put a lot of pressure on people to make sure there was a test that recreated the bug. You were not allowed to work. You could, he would not talk about patches to fix it until there was a test to recreate it so that they never had a new bug, uh, an old bug. They always had new bugs uh, for a long time. MySQL always had new bugs, uh, never had a regression. Uh, and that was very effective. It also was really labor and resource intensive uh, to make that work. So if you're going from we don't really test uh, and have this vision of comprehensive testing, but you cannot actually get there yet. How can you build a good enough test plan? Um, and the first piece is, frankly, have a plan. Like actually write it down. Stop, take a couple hours, not a massive amount of time, but actually write out a plan. Spell out what's going to be tested, who's testing it, how much. Have a conversation about what are you going to automate? It is resource intensive to set up automated tests, but particularly when you're new to it. So talk about where it makes sense and where it doesn't. What do you know how to automate already? What's gonna be hard? Uh, assign some basic responsibilities for who's gonna do the testing, uh, who's gonna monitor the results. Um, focus in on your team's weak points, right? You're having a conversation about testing because something went wrong. What's been going wrong? Let's start by focusing your testing there and then work out uh, as your team gets better at that and you're good and you know, faster and faster at building tests for those things, then you'll expand out into other places. You'll have new weaknesses that you need to address. Um, and because this is, should be part of a process as part of a growing team, don't be satisfied with good enough. Uh, a, you're gonna get better. So you're gonna be able to get faster and more efficient at how you build these things. So be looking at how we, can we make each test plan iteratively better for each project uh, as we move forward and get better. Um, one of the things you need to have on your team is a champion. Uh, somebody who will kind of take the leadership role of saying, I'm going to build these test plans. I'm going to come in and sit with the project team and build it. The one place you really need leadership buy-in is having some kind of rule for when it's going to be important, right? If you think about that, you know, the, the, the silly kind of wavy curve I drew, the and, and think about your experience with projects, as you grow, not every project is the new big one you're struggling with. You're still picking up projects that are back at your older scale that you don't need as much testing for, that you don't need the rigor. So how do you decide when to do it? And, and it's things about, you know, whether it's number of people on the team or budget size, have some metric that says, okay, this is the place where we start having problems. So Chris is gonna come in and he's gonna be the guy to write our tests. And we're going to agree that these are projects are worth spending those resources there. Re you really want to build in your testing into the workflow, uh, regardless of your methodology. It, and it shouldn't be a wait to the end. Even if you're on a waterfall-ish approach, you should be testing throughout the project. A, that helps absorb the budget across the project. It doesn't feel like this, hey, we got to the end and now we have to spend money on testing. Uh, but you're seeing the project move more rapidly throughout because you're providing useful testing. Plan to have a blend of that automation. You're gonna put some automation in, but you're not putting in all the automations. Uh, you're gonna have some of it still be manual testing, uh, but they're all gonna come with step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, you know, it isn't gonna be, hey, Will, can you go test the thing over there, that new feature? Uh, can you, you can figure out how it works and uh, understand what's coming out. Take the time to do the rigor of having step-by-step -step instructions of go in, create a blog post. It should look like this. It should end up in these places. Um, 
and understand that when you're starting out, you're not in full rigorous test-driven development. Your testing process and suites are not a contract yet. When you do full true test-driven development, they kind of are, and they kind of should be. Uh, right? You, you agree on your test, you write your test, and then your test must pass, and you get there. And that can be awesome and really great when you have the efficiency and rigor to do that and the time to do that. When you're being less formal uh, and you're growing into it, your test process, your suite, it's going to change over the course of the project. Uh, and frankly, right, our requirements usually shift. Uh, particularly the more agile-ish we're being, the more the project is, the, the spec is going to shift. And so uh, you should be adjusting. Uh, the other piece of it is both for working it into your workflow and for figuring out how to do your step-by-step -step instructions, think about the, the language of your methodology and try to be writing them to match that language. So right, if you're Agile-like, then you want to be talking about user stories and story points and those pieces of it. If you're waterfall-ish, you're talking more about requirements and specifications and outcomes that are uh, driven out of that language. Uh, that'll help be the team more comfortable. It'll make the clients more comfortable because that's what they're expecting from you. Uh, and it'll help you bring it all together. Particularly early on, it's really helpful to think of, right, there's a lot of different kinds of testings you can put into a comprehensive plan, but it's useful to think about two major buckets. Uh, the first being kind of the classic unit tests that we're all familiar with in terms of writing uh, testing code, which is that very small atomic, does this function work the way it's supposed to? I give it its expected inputs, I check its expected outputs, maybe I trigger a few error conditions, but I'm very focused on one function at a time, very small, very tight. Uh, there's also a notion, a notion of doing functional tests where you're testing uh, a whole bunch of units at once, right? Not only does this function work, but does it work in its broader context when I'm firing 16 other things in succession so that I actually know whether I got from my, the beginning of my requirement or my user story to the end, not just that one little piece, the one little piece is super useful, particularly for avoiding regression and for having good, tight, automated tests. Uh, and th those are going to be the ones that scream for automation. The functional tests are going to be more the, okay, I do this, and then that triggers this process, and it triggers these nine hooks, and those fall, uh, other things, and these six views rebuild, and, and, and. And you need to actually have a documentation of that. You usually can automate the testing on those, but they're usually much harder to automate. If you can pull it off, you're gonna save much more time uh, because it is a more intensive thing to do. But those are the things you're gonna look at early on as likely to be candidates for your manual testing. And you're gonna need to give yourself rules, right? You can actually literally fall back to the XKCD grid. It's actually useful uh, despite being cute. Uh, but also looking at, right, anytime the platform requires it, obviously you're going to test. So if you're on a platform like Salesforce, where you have to have a 75% test coverage on your code, you will have 75% test coverage, and you might as well write good tests. Um, anytime you're expecting regressions, right, you know a piece of the system is going to be subject to change. Maybe the client didn't spec it out super well. Uh, maybe you know it's, you know it's sitting in the middle of a lot of complex processes. You want to expect you know that the pieces around it are going to change, that you want to look at for testing because uh, any of that change could break it. Um, anytime you're just going to run the test, frankly, a lot uh, and you know, right, we're going to get, you're going to get bored and you're not going to run the same stupid test over and over and over time. Um, it can be really helpful to force rigor and clarity with a client of like, we're gonna write through this test and you can actually kind of work with the client on the, how are we going to test this? How will you know as the client that this is working? Um, you know, I've seen it often with membership organizations where they have a lot of complex membership statuses. How do you build out that uh, set of memberships so that you know you're generating the membership values they want? How will they know? Uh, they can often get confused. They, get, uh, they struggle to define that well helping them walk through and writing out uh, in very clear English how they're going to walk, you know, create a membership and recognize that it's valid 
uh, can force that clarity in places that you're not uh, otherwise getting it. Um, and anytime there are lots of data points that have to, to reconcile, uh, whether you're talking about accounting kinds of data uh, or other things. We had a project recently where uh, you know, they asked me to come help test something and we were looking at it going, you know, by the time the person and I were walking it through, we built a spreadsheet with five tabs and, you know, 80 some rows on the final tab. And I'm sitting there going like, I am not hand testing this. Like, and it took me, I think, uh, six or seven hours to automate the testing of that. Um, and the first time that was probably about cost neutral to my testing it by hand, maybe more expensive. By the fifth time we'd run it, we were saving big bucks. Uh, and we're much more assured that every time we make a small change in this system, we can quickly validate. Uh, and that test is slow. I mean, that test takes like 10 minutes to run, but it's 10 minutes of machine time, not 10 minutes of human time. And to pull through all of those 80 outputs uh, was a significant amount of human labor. Uh, and so to have the machine do it is saving big bucks uh, in a real big hurry and makes the client much happier because they're much more assured that we're delivering uh, what they need. For your manual testing, you want to look at those, it's that careful step-by-step -step instruction. They need to be written out so that anybody on the team can parachute in and do it. That, you know, if whoever either has the extra time right now, you know, isn't busy on other client work, or frankly is the cheapest person uh, in, on the team, and therefore their time uh, can be allocated to this without pulling them off of other things and they can burn a lot of time there. You want that to be able, that person to be able to be rotated out without them having to be an expert in the whole project, uh, right? And often you can get into the like, we all know Drupal, any of us can test it, which is again, fine if you're building a nice pretty brochure. By the time you're building a membership organization that's tied to you know six different third-party data systems and has all kinds of fancy API interactions and whatnot. You know, I know Will spent a lot of time building uh, really cool stuff to do shipping calculations. And I could probably go test it and I would know that I got numbers back. I'd be like, cool, Will, your code doesn't throw errors. Do I have any way of knowing that the numbers are right uh, without somebody writing me some instructions to say, if you put in these values, you should get these outputs. Uh, Often you can start your writing before you actually can complete it. Like a test-driven development, your manual testing, you can write these instructions out before you're done. Um, ideally, you would do this at the very beginning and then, but you can write the midway through. Right? It's that process you're going through while you're testing it yourself as the developer. You can stop and say, okay, let me just write this down. Nothing else, it'll remind me how to do it next week after I take a weekend off and Forget about all this, um, but it also means that, that it's become something else. Hey, can you go in and double check to make sure this is actually still working? I've lost the forest for the trees here. I've been working on this for two months and I need somebody to go in and spend some time following these instructions, telling me if I'm actually seeing what I think I'm seeing and playing around and kicking the corners. It can also then become the basis of the documentation you hand over to your client, right? You slap the logo on the top, you switch to the brand standard font, you put a nice, friendly introduction in uh, and you hand it over to the client and say, this is how you validate. Uh, and it gives a document that they can retain uh, and use for training and testing of the system as they're rolling it out. Um, and again, it should continue to sound like your main methodology. Continue to use the language there, particularly in that nice introduction you slap on the top uh, and whatever you're calling it in front of the client, you're gonna use that same language from your methodology so that they're having a consistent experience with you as a company and as a team. A few final reminders about general testing process uh, and building out your first plans. Uh, the person doing the testing is generally not the person doing the fixing. Even with an automated test, right? The machine is doing the testing. And so when we get failures back, yeah, it can go right back to the developer and they're gonna go do the testing or the, they're gonna go do the fixing. I've, I've had experiences where folks, you know, I say, I, I've been testing it. And they come back and say, great. But it, you know, through these errors and I say, uh-huh, I'm testing, I'm not fixing. Send it back to the team who built it. I don't, it's gonna take me 10 times more time to figure out how to fix. I found the bug. 
uh, and I can show them how to reproduce it. I provided them really useful value, but my value is not in speed of fixing. Um, and so you have to set that norm that like early on in testing, things are going to fail. Even if it's not test driven development, you're testing because you don't expect it to work yet. Um, until you, unless you think you're about to hand it to the client, it's probably you should expect at least some portion of the product still to be failing. Um, anytime you hear somebody say, I tested it yesterday and the team is working today, you assume it failed or the testing was no good or it's going to need retesting because if the team is working on it, it wasn't done yet. Um, it's going to need retesting, revisiting to make sure it's work. Um, and overall, just never let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? Get a good enough process in place to get better uh, and continue to iterate forward. If you're not testing, testing, more testing is better. Keep getting better, keep moving forward. Don't get hung up on having to get all the way to finish on your first pass. Don't shoot for super rigorous, incredible, awesome, you know, uh, test driven development with a full CI and an automated process end to end. Those are super cool when you have the time and resources and the team that knows how to put them together. Uh, but don't hang up waiting for that. Get started with testing, start increasing the rigor and that kind of process can follow partially because you'll get bigger and stronger clients who are paying you more money and have higher expectations of your testing and you will grow into their expectations and they'll be paying you for it. And with that, BD and I will take questions. Awesome uh, presentation, extremely topical. Um, I guess, uh, I don't know if you have experience with this yet. I know um, this is, it sounds like uh, the larger part of an initiative I think is common in a lot of agencies, to be honest. Um, how do you balance I, I found when getting larger clients, how do you balance of um, this is our testing plan, this is where we have built expertise um, in this tool chain with this methodology, um, something like, uh, I don't know, we, uh, we prefer unit tests with um, this technology and you know, we don't we don't find a lot of value in uh, visual regression testing, or you just you 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 know you hone your craft over time, both in internal skills and individual skills on the team. Uh, how do you balance that with your larger clients that are more interested that um, would rather you satisfy that requirement within their ecosystem or their system? I mean, to a certain extent, when you're when you're working with a consulting structure, you're always bending a little bit to the client need anyway. And there's usually anywhere I've been, there's been that sense of kind of that thing we could do if we had another X number of hours or Y budget, you know, there, there's that next thing we want to be doing that we haven't brought in yet. Um, and often those stretch clients are in that space. Um, some of them are just going to be on a different tool chain and that's just going to be a flat, in my experience, that's a flat out negotiation of like, you want us to switch off our tool chain that our team can, you know, we can estimate this will take us 20 hours. We don't know how to estimate it on your team. So we're going to throw a, a percentage overhead on top, um, I, you know, and just say, yeah, this is what we think it's going to be to do it in your tool chain. We'll do it in your tool chain because you're the consult, you're the client you're paying, but if you're demanding it, it's going to have, you know, there's maybe a penalty here uh, for our team that is an expert over here. And this is what we're really good at. And we can do it efficiently here or we'll do it your way. Um, and, and finding a way to strike that balance. Uh, I, I am currently lucky that I have, uh, I'm surrounded by an excellent business development team who's very good at that uh, push and pull and is very good at uh, structuring that in and, and helping the client make a choice. And sometimes it is the right thing for the client to spend a little more money and have you do it in their tool chain. Um, you know, I've definitely had clients where they wanted to do things like the perfect formal right way in Pantheon. And there were some advantages to that. Uh, but right, you run it through GitHub and Circle CI and automatic building and all that. There's overhead for that. That just takes some time. Uh, it gives them some rigor and it gives them some protections and some nice stuff but it just takes some time. Uh, and 
it may save them the time over the course of their work, even if it's not saving it over the course of your project. Uh, and to and working kind of frankly with them to find that balance. Yeah, it, I mean, we it's definitely a challenge that we're in a lot these days. And I think, I mean, I would entirely put it on the challenge of being a consultancy of uh, and dealing with different clients from different walks of life so much as it's, I don't know, I have no empirical devil, uh, evidence to back this up, but I don't know if it's that the idea of testing and quality assurance engineering is new enough, but it's really difficult to walk into uh, the situation and instantly be on the same page. I, I think I, I, I struggle and it's amazing how many different interpretations people have for what automated testing means. Um, there doesn't seem to be like a consensus school of thought. I, I foolishly thought that it was straightforward and that was we're taking the test suite that we have built, be it unit, functional, behavioral, and we're automating it. And uh, some uh, automation engineers had very, very different opinions about what that meant and what it implied. I mean, I think that's some of why you get into trouble with the contractual test. The, the thing I referred to at the beginning is contractual testing, where somebody writes in a contract, often literally, or like, you will perform tests to this standard. And, and you, and often the person writing this, writing it in good faith of like, if you did it our way to this standard, it would be great. But you really quickly get into risk of like, <laughs> I can hit that contractual obligation. I may or may not do anything useful, but I can meet that contractual obligation. Uh, and and I think that's some of that is that the relative newness of some of this. Uh, I, I do also think like people often get into the building analogy, right? Like software is new, buildings we've been doing for thousands of years. People should be really good at estimating. Uh, and you know, why can't software engineers estimate as well as building engineers? And we sit there and say, well, building engineers. Uh, have been doing this for a thousand years. Uh, we also, the reality is, and they need 10% contingency and they go over budget. Try to particularly, try to build anything big. Accurate. Try to build a, a whole building from scratch. And uh, we, we, when we build a bridge, we understand we're crossing this exact ravine. We know exactly what we're doing. It's not uh, abstract problem solving. Right, and, and still somewhere in the middle, somebody says, oh yeah. Uh, that delivery of steel is six weeks late, which is going to screw up these 16 problems. And now you're over budget because I've got a team here that can't work, but I got to pay them because here. Um, and, you know, it's not like these aren't really well-defined problems. So I, I think that's the other place that I try to provide a little bit of gentle pushback is that expectation that like your estimate is perfect uh, on that just like, no, it's it's an estimate, and you know, anything around testing to some extent is you're setting up that same kind of structure. Like, we're going to create testing that we think covers all the use cases that matter. Um, but between the halting problem and so many classic stories in programming, that it's not going to test at all. There's going to be bugs that slip through, oh, and sure. you can't write a contract that is going to be bulletproof. Um, and, and just kind of having that, that frank and friendly understanding that, yeah, you're going to work in good faith. I mean, it's not, it's not about trying to be squirrely, um, but the reality is sometimes, you know, you're just testing in an environment that you're not familiar with, or you're dropping into somebody else's code base. You're working on top of a platform that has limitations, um, you know, that make it hard, right? I mean, running a full test suite against Drupal core, it just takes time. Uh, you know, they, I remember when I first tried to do test driven development on my side projects, and I still like to do it. It's it's kind of nice to have a full set suite of tests. Um, but like Python and Node tests can run fast. I mean, you can have it really run every single test, every commit, till your project gets huge. You can't do that with Drupal. You can't do that with Salesforce. I mean, we've got a 
a set of stuff that we work with very routinely on Salesforce. Uh, it's a two hour setup phase. Like you kick the test off and it's two hours before the first test runs. Um, well, it sets up the servers and spins up orgs and installs stuff and loads data. It, you know, you're two hours in and it hasn't done anything useful yet. And that's just the way it is. And you know, we've had, you know, now and then you have people like, well, you know, we should have tests that run really fast. Like, that's great. My test is really fast, but, but get comfy because it's going to take two hours to config the org. Um, and then it'll take three seconds to run the test. Um, and that's just, right, I mean, that's just dealing with Salesforce and MPSB, which is where you are. A good thing I would add in when dealing with folks is also that is that blend of some manual testing of recognizing that you can automate a lot, but you're still going to have a human backstop. Um, and even like that, that's the whole point of ghost testing, even, even in a truly rigorous, fully comprehensive plan, you still have a human backstop. You still have a human go double check the last of it. Uh, my brother-in-law works on uh, hospital equipment as a QA manager. And one of the things that you I mean, they have to have somebody actually like push buttons on a machine. Um, when they upgrade the software, they have lots and lots of automated testing, but in the end, somebody has got to load it on the machine and punch buttons and make sure that that button is still wired to the, you know, logic controller that's still hitting the software the way they thought it did. Uh, and the way that all the tests assume it's wired together. Definitely okay with it in that case. There's there's value in that. <laughs> As somebody who occasionally has medical scans done, yes, I'm a big fan of that work. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they have, they have very complex, rigorous automations, but even then you still have to fall back to humans. There's, there's never, in my experience, a place where you get to stop having that. Not really. Uh, your automation can carry you a long way, but it never gets you home. Oh, for sure. Thank you. Unless there's any other questions or closing remarks, I will stop the recording here. I'm good. Unless you got questions, Will? No, no, not a whole lot of questions on my end. It was a very good presentation. Thanks for sharing. <laughs>